Growing up in a small town in the Midwest, with not too much to do, my friends and I found ourselves bored on a Saturday night. After exhausting all our go-to options of playing video games and eating junk food, we decided to try something a little bit different, a little more exciting. Ding dong ditching. We had planned to ding dong ditch the old eerie house at the end of our street. But little did we know that this seemingly innocent escapade would plunge us into a terrifying encounter that would haunt our memories forever. As we crept along the shadowy streets, adrenaline coursed through our veins and mixed in with excitement and a hint of trepidation. The house in question with its faded paint and overgrown yard had long been a subject of whispered rumors and ghostly tales. It was a place that stirred both curiosity and fear in equal measure. The night was still and an eerie silence hung in the air as we approached the porch. Our hearts raised, palms sweaty with anticipation. One of us, brimming with bravado, rang the doorbell and darted into the darkness, seeking refuge behind a nearby tree. Laughter erupted among us as we waited the residents' puzzled reaction. But as the seconds had ticked by, a chilling realization had settled over us. There was no reaction. No sound of footsteps or a disgruntled muttering or a porch light turning on. The house remained shrouded in silence and darkness, as if it had swallowed our prank whole. Unnerved, we gathered our courage and ventured closer, cautiously looking through the windows. The interior was dimly lit, casting shadows on the worn-out furniture. There was an unsettling air of neglect and abandonment that permeated every corner, sending a shiver down our spines. As we thought about our next move, a faint creak echoed through the silence, raising the hairs on the back of our necks. A chill wind whispered through the trees, carrying an indistinct murmur that sent a wave of unease through our group. We traded nervous glances, our confidence waning. Suddenly, a flickering light caught our attention, a dim glow emanating from the storm shelter outside. It danced eerily, beckoning us closer like a moth to a flame. A collective decision was made, a decision driven by a morbid curiosity that defied reason. As we opened up the hatches and descended the stairs into the abyss below, a musty odor assaulted our senses, blending with the scent of decay. Our footsteps echoed through the narrow corridor, growing louder with each agonizing step. It was as if the house itself had resisted our intrusion, its dark secrets threatening to engulf us. A sense of foreboding intensified as we entered a room bathed in an eerie glow. The sight that greeted us froze in our tracks. Photographs, newspaper clippings, and odd symbols were arranged in a twisted tapestry, each hinting at a sinister story. Many of the photographs that were hung up were live-action shots of children from around the neighborhood, out playing in the yard or riding their bikes. And a few of the newspaper clippings were from disappearances that had occurred in the area. After seeing that, we knew that we had to get out of there, and we didn't waste any time. We ran back up the stairs and all sprinted back to our homes. The next morning, I had told my parents about what had happened and obviously they were concerned. They called the police and soon they checked out the old house at the end of the street. They discovered the storm shelter with the same things that we had seen, the photographs and the newspaper clippings but the house itself was unoccupied. This story soon hit the local news as well and was the talk of the town for the following weeks, but it died down after that. They never did find the person that had created that shrine or whatever you want to call it. But the kids and parents of the neighborhood were always on edge after that. As soon as I grew up and I was able to start my own life, I moved away and got out of that town. Nothing specific ever happened to me after that night, but the place just didn't feel like home anymore. It's sad that one twisted individual can ruin that for you.
Halloween night. Stereotypical, I know. Several years ago, I was followed home by a stranger. I worked at a large mall about an hour away from home. The store was closed at 10 p.m., and the only bus home ran every hour and only dropped me off two thirds of the way home, and I would have to walk the rest. This usually happened between 11 to 1 a.m. at night, depending on if I could get the store closed down on time and if the bus wasn't too packed for me to get on. I am not a small woman. I am fairly tall and fairly round and not the most attractive. My uniform was just a polo shirt and black trousers, flat shoes, all covered with a thick coat. I didn't see him get on the bus. To be fair, the bus was packed and noisy, and the walkways were crowded, and I did my best to just block it all out with my headphones and stare out the window. I am not a people person, and having been at work for 12 hours on a busy day, surrounded by these awful people, I was just pissed off and desperate to get off the bus and be alone. When we finally got to my stop, and I managed to struggle my way to the front of the bus through people that refused to move, I stumbled into the night air and breathed a sigh of relief. A couple of people got off the bus behind me, and I started up the hill crossing the road to continue up the side street that led to my road. This side street is very long and has offshoots into residential streets on very steep hills going down. The street itself is lined with small shops and there is a high grassy bank on the opposite side that has houses along the top so it feels very isolated after the shops close down. Very few people get off at my bus stop this time of night, and even fewer head in the same direction. Those that do cut off and go down one of these hills long before I get to the hill that leads up to my building. Now, the street isn't very well lit, the street lamps are few and far between. Several of them are motion activated, so they don't even turn on until you're right on top of them. I've walked home in the dark this way a thousand times, and I've walked to work this way at three or four in the morning a thousand times too. That was for a different job. While I always enjoy the cool night air, I am not afraid of the dark, and I love how bright the stars are where I live. I don't loiter. I walk fast so I can get home and shower as soon as possible. This night, I notice someone walking behind me. I usually do because, like I stated above, very few people walk this way at this time of night. I was aware of him and waiting for him to turn down one of the side streets. He didn't. It felt a little weird. But I'm not the only person that lives in the area, so maybe he just isn't regularly walking this way at this time of night. So I've just never seen him before. I get to the medical surgery and car park at the bottom of my hill and cut across it as I always do. At this point, I know if he also heads up my hill, I need to worry a little more. The hill goes alongside the surgery, and then there are high walls on my side of the street that block off the flats 
in the other side from my road. They can only be accessed from the road before mine. At the top of the hill, this wall ends and turns into an alley that runs parallel to my building. The opposite side of the road has multiple closed pubs, a closed corner store, and an old church that has been converted into a Muslim worship center, which is also closed. There are even less street lamps here, and my building is surrounded by a metal fence with 20 or so feet of grass that slopes down to the entrance of the building where the doorway is lit up. The point is, it's isolated, and the only reason someone should be up here this time of night is if they live in my building. This guy crosses the car park after me, and now I'm feeling concerned. I know he doesn't live in my building. There are nine flats over three floors, and ten people. I know all of them, and they all know me. We would recognize each other even at this level of darkness. So, I walk faster up the hill hoping to get into the building before he catches up. He starts walking faster too. I can hear him gaining on me, and by the time that I get to the gate, I know that he's too close to me for me to be able to open the door and get inside before he's on me. The building is dark and I know everyone is in bed, and it makes me feel all alone. And at this point, I'm crapping myself. So, thinking quickly, I cross the road and walk further up the hill behind parked cars. I use the opportunity to swing my backpack off of one shoulder and grab my keys. I wait for him to follow me and get behind the cars too, so it'll take just a little longer for him to be able to cross back over her before I bolt across the road, throwing open the gate. I swing it hard behind me because he's now running at me, and I think it will either latch before he can catch it, or it will hit him. Either way, it'll buy me a few seconds. I slide down the slope barely staying on my feet because it's dangerously slippery when it's wet. I turn the corner at the bottom and slam my keycard on the reader, pressing hard on the heavy door before it beeps so it will open that much faster. The door is heavy and on a fire safety hinge, that means I can't slam it or force it closed. The stairs are a couple of steps into the building and to the left. I live on the top floor. It's not a big building. Three flats on each floor, two flights of stairs. It's also a concrete stairwell, so every little sound echoes and can be heard behind closed doors. I get inside the building and immediately bolt up the stairs. I'm only a few steps up when the door flies open behind me, and this guy comes after me. Feeling a little more secure now that I'm in my building, and only feet away from my neighbors, I spin around before he reaches me, and slam my heavy backpack into him. He falls back to the landing, and manages to catch himself by grabbing a hold of the handrail. I scream, what the heck, at the top of my lungs and I hold my bag in front of me. Now we're inside and the stairwell is lit by the motion activated lights, I get my first proper look at him. He's a little taller than me, I'm 5 foot 8, he's black and old enough to be graying. His clothes are weird, all made out of that weird waxy material some weatherproof jackets are made of, and he's wearing heavy boots. I don't recognize him at all, 
and he looks up at me with wide eyes as I stare down at him. I'm fully prepared to kick him in the face and throw my bag if I have to. I don't want him to be able to follow me into my flat, so I stare him down. He begins to stutter, hands ringing over the handrail and ducking his head a little, trying to look pathetic and harmless. He mutters something about visiting his son. Like I stated before, nine people other than me live in this building. At that time, none of them were black, and none of them other than myself were young enough for him to be their parent. Even if his son did live here, how would he know to follow me off of the bus to get to my building? Why did he follow me when I moved away from my building? And why did he chase after me? He could have walked to the building and buzzed up to his son for him to let him in if that was even true. I began shouting at him to get out, repeating those words over and over again, sprinkling in, I don't know you and you don't live here. He continues muttering, making his excuses, but I shout over him. When I hear neighbors moving around and coming towards their doors, probably to look through their peepholes, I begin to back up the stairs. My neighbor is right at the bottom of the stairs behind the man, opens her door leaving her chain and peering through at us. She asks me if I'm okay and if she needs to call the police. The guy spins to stare at her, his hands out in a stop motion, and I hear another neighbor open his door behind the stairs, also on the ground level. He calls out to ask if everything is okay too, and I just yell out to the both of them. He followed me home. I don't know him. He won't leave. I'm now at the top of the first step of stairs, still looking down at him. My male neighbor starts telling him to get the heck out, either more intimidated by the man than he was me, or realizing that he was outnumbered, he begins trying to open the front door. You have to press a button to get it to open, and he clearly doesn't know this. Further evidence that he's never been here before. Feeling more secure now that I'm not alone, and he's trying to leave. I bolt across the landing and up the final flight of stairs and get my door open before locking it behind me. I was dripping in sweat and very close to a panic attack. I dragged my hoover to the front door and propped it up, just in case someone tried to open my door and I would hear it fall. I didn't sleep very well that night listening to every sound in the building and luckily, I didn't have to work the next day. I woke up at about 6am to a lot of sound in the building's landings. I could hear people opening every bin, shoot room and coming back out again. I peered through my people to see uniformed policemen searching the common areas of the building. I didn't call the police, but I assume one of the neighbors downstairs did. The bin rooms are fairly large, so I imagine they were checking to see if someone was hiding. I don't know for sure and I didn't ask, other than asking me if I was okay when we saw each other next. The neighbors that helped out that night never said anything else about it. I don't know who he was or what he wanted. I've never seen him again and I stopped working at that shopping center a couple of years later. I do feel guilty for not calling the police, just in case he had done this before or since and the women didn't manage to get away. But at the time, I just wanted to forget about it and move forward.